to falsely accuse your enemies of conspiracy. A simple ploy, considering the Delatorius were happy to oblige in exchange for bounty. The spies profited from the ambiguous wording of laws concerning treason, so they would call out others on treason, and they just weren't incentivized to do things that were done for the good of the Republic, or for the Empire. The laws are so vague that charges could be brought over seemingly trivial reasons, such as carrying a coin bearing Augustus's face into the bathroom, thus insulting the person of the emperor. A new spy network was necessary, and Augustus created one from an unlikely government agency. He took members of a fire brigade and transformed them into a new covert police force. This force was given the name Vigilus and began to function as secret agents, wearing typical Roman dress and blending in with the population. The Vigilus only operated within Rome and worked closely with the Praetorian Guard. There they remained until 330, when Constantine relocated the capital of Rome to Constantinople in the province of Thrace. He took the security force with him to his newly christened city, where they performed similar functions, albeit under a different name. Augustus developed two other branches of intelligence in the Roman military, the Speculatores and the Exploratores. The Speculatores were used as couriers and secret spies, while the Exploratores were used as scouts. These positions already existed in the Roman military structure, but they were only duties given to soldiers on a case-by-case basis. They weren't professionals trained in espionage. Under Augustus, spying and intelligence gathering became professionalized and formally integrated into the military administration. So all these officials had probably read the Tactica, or had at least informally absorbed some of its lessons. The speculatories were organized into units of 10. They were responsible for border defense as well as acted as agents provocateur internally to reveal any plots against the empire. The commission system of the delatories was eliminated to prevent similar corruption from entering this new corps. The exploratories were not a secret group like the speculatories. Their only covert operations took place behind enemy lines, not in Roman society itself. They gathered intelligence such as the locations and troop strength of enemy forces. Despite all of these developments, the Roman military's intelligence gathering system wasn't still being used to its full potential. This resulted in a number of avoidable defeats. The greatest failures occurred during the Battle of the Teutonberg Forest in 9 AD, in which an alliance of Germanic tribes, led by Arminius of the Cherusci, ambushed the Romans, led by Publius Quintilicus Varus. Through the poor use of the legion's scouts and spies, the Roman commanders were lured into an ambush, which resulted in the destruction of three legions, approximately 30,000 soldiers, as well as their civilian auxiliaries. This defeat halted Roman advancement to the north. By the 2nd century, the need for a new secret service was necessary, an organization that could provide empire-wide intelligence services, not just on one-off military campaigns. This was no simple proposition. Even the powerful Roman Empire and its sophisticated road network, which was by far the best in the ancient world, couldn't create a surveillance network to spy on subjects throughout Rome's far-flung domains. A solution was finally found in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. The organized network of spies, known as the Frumentari, emerged during this period, in which Rome was rife with endless conspiracies and political plotting. Scholars differ as to when the Frumentari began spying directly for the Roman emperor, but most likely they began under Emperor Domitian in 100 AD. Their duties included gathering information and acting as couriers, along with committing assassinations. The Frumentari come from the supply section of the Roman army. They were non-commissioned officers and centurions, primarily responsible for purchasing grain for the individual legions. They were essentially wheat collectors. The name frumentari comes from the Latin word frumentum, which means grain, and frumentarius, or collectors of wheat. Such work made them ideal for intelligence gathering. Supplying the army with grain required them to constantly travel throughout Rome and its provinces to secure enough supplies. They were in frequent contact with army officers and privileged with insider information. If you knew that you needed a certain amount of bushels at this location, you could probably guess that there were 30 or 40,000 troops coming to this place, even if this was top secret intelligence, because the Roman army had to have its logistics network set up so that it could supply troops on the march. They also kept contact with military suppliers, logistics officers, local officials, tradesmen, farmers, and notables. These relationships span the social spectrum giving them significant intelligence of any territory in the empire. 
So if you knew there were grumblings in the working class and a revolt was going to rise up, you could perhaps know more than an elite spy who only confirmed with other elite officers and was walled off from huge sections of society. So the emperor realized that he had a ready-made spy network at his disposal. Unlike most secret police forces, the Frumentari were open about their existence. They wore distinctive uniforms, and the emperor used this visibility as a means of exerting control over the population, letting them know that they were being watched. The Roman Empire was based on a system of patronage, not ideology, and the emperor preferred to have his tools of power visible to the public. A uniform was furthermore appropriate for them, since their office had military characteristics. We know from inscriptions on Frumentari gravestones that they were attached to individual legions due to their historical functions of serving them with supplies. But these officials didn't always remain in their uniforms. The agents went undercover if warranted by the investigation or if they had to deliver confidential intelligence. Over time, the Frumentari proved to be so useful to the emperors that they began to supplant the speculatores and soon became the main secret service in the Roman Empire. There were an estimated 200 Frumentari serving at any time. They delivered regular intelligence reports to Rome's imperial center, describing military and political threats. From the vantage point of the emperor, his domains transformed from a chaotic expanse to a comprehensible whole. Recruitment into the Frumentari showed that some aspects of Roman life remained a meritocracy. Rosemary Sheldon writes in Intelligence Activities in Ancient Rome that traditional German scholars once thought they were recruited exclusively from the western, less barbaric provinces, making them an elite Roman version of the SS. But modern researchers believe that they were recruited from local garrisons. All legions sent Frumentari to Rome, and they could originate from anywhere, whether the hinterlands of Rome or borderlands. Advantages came with a multicultural spy force. Successfully infiltrating villages in the empire required a broad sampling of its peoples, and all Italian or Gallic force would do poorly in North Africa or Judea. Unfortunately, we don't know the exact recruitment strategy, although it was nothing as formal as a Navy SEAL or CIA enlistment. The Frumentari operated throughout the Roman Empire, but they were concentrated in Rome and worked in conjunction with the city's police force. The unit had a base at the Castra Peregrina on Rome's Caelian Hill, looking across the street from a station of the Vigiles. They were under the command of a senior centurion who reported directly to the emperor. The Frumentari in Rome were originally tasked with investigating and arresting suspects, but their duties expanded beyond those of local law enforcement and took on elements of empire-wide investigation and intelligence gathering. They worked across all military policing levels. As such, the range of their powers increased, and they were allowed to torture and even assassinate if need be. Hadrian, who ruled from 117 to 138, and who was widely regarded by his contemporaries as a humanist, was the first emperor to use the Frumentari as investigators. Hadrian first had them spy on members of the imperial senate and other aristocrats. Like any government bureaucracy, the powers of this agency increased over the decades, along with their jurisdiction. From the 2nd to the 3rd centuries, Frumentari began to perform internal surveillance and spy on almost every Roman citizen, if possible, suspected of treason or illegal activities, regardless of social status. They closely watched senators, generals, Christian dissidents, and anyone else who was deemed to be a danger to the state. Soon, no one was immune from the Frumentari. They became a tool of state surveillance rather than an investigative or detective unit. An account of Hadrian's use of security forces illustrates the role of the Frumentari in Roman society and the extent to which the emperor was aware of the private lives of prominent citizens. Hadrian's vigilance wasn't confined to his own household, but extended to those of his friends. He bred into all the private lives and did it so skillfully that they were never aware of his knowledge until he revealed it himself. In what such incident, the wife of a certain man wrote to her husband, complaining that he was so preoccupied by pleasures and baths that he wouldn't return home to her. Hadrian discovered this through his agents. When the husband asked for a furlough, Hadrian reproached him with his fondness for his baths and his pleasures. The man exclaimed, Did my wife write you just what she wrote me? Emperors Commodus and Didius Julianus, two emperors in the late 2nd century, whose poor leadership triggered massive turmoil within the empire, ordered the Frumentari to carry out numerous assassinations, as did their advisors. During the reign of Commodus, 
the Praetorian prefect Paternus ordered Frumentari to murder Soteras, a Bithynian Greek who served at the emperor's palace chamberlain and was believed to be one of Commodus's debauchers. In 193, Didius Julianus likely sent a centurion of Frumentari to assassinate Septimus Severus during the turbulent year of the five emperors. The plan failed, Septimius Severus revolted, and he became the next emperor. In the Civil War of 238, the Frumentari were used as special imperial messengers when Pupianus Maximus circulated them in every province to proclaim that anyone who helped his opponent, Maximinus Thrax, would be considered an enemy of the state. These secret police were clearly not short of work in the second century, when senators and emperors were in constant need of political killings. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Their order thrived on instability. As a result, the Frumentari were prone to abusing their office. Some even suspected them of sowing political discord in order to profit from the chaos. According to 4th century historian Aurelius Victor, these Frumentari, although they seem to have been instituted to search out and report on whatever disturbances were emerging in the provinces, by nefariously inventing false charges and instilling fear everywhere, especially in the remote areas, they shamefully plundered everything. Spying, torture, and assassination were their most notorious duties, but not their exclusive ones. As public servants, they more often perform routine bureaucratic duties than covert operations. These included supervising prisons, public mines, and quarries. They also oversaw labor camps and building projects. Other frumentari worked as unofficial tax collectors, supervisors, and couriers. Despite performing menial duties on occasion, they are proud of their status. The frumentari put their insignia and rank on their gravestones. A number of inscriptions honor the leader on the Castra Peregrina, which suggests that the Frumentari had a high social status and rank. In addition to political assassination and torture, the Frumentari also persecuted Christians. When Paul was awaiting his trial in Rome in the 60s, a member of the order kept guard. Other stories from early church tradition recall the Frumentari searching for Christians to arrest them, followed by their torture and execution. Eusebius, an early church historian, describes an incident in which the Frumentari searched for a man named Dionysius. He was able to hide in his house before escaping Rome with the aid of his brethren. Other first century sources report plainclothes soldiers arresting Christians. After a fire burned down most of Rome in 64, they provided Nero with false evidence that he used to implicate Christians as the cause. According to Tacitus, the Christians were tortured by the Frumentari until they confessed to starting the fire. So we don't know if the Frumentari actually did this persecution, or maybe by the time Christians were writing these accounts, the Frumentari were so looked down upon that they were a convenient scapegoat to blame for whatever problem you had. The covert role of the Frumentari became well known in society. As a result, the population hated the organization for their targeting, surveillance, arbitrary arrests, and torture of marginalized groups. By the end of the 3rd century, they were viewed as a plague within the empire, threatening to destroy the host. The reputation sunk even lower when they took on the most despised but lucrative position in the government. Tax collection. Like most Roman tax collectors, they likely extorted their way to significant wealth. Greeks nicknamed the collectiones, or revenuers. The number of frumentari continued to rise, making them an easy target for derision. Roman subjects and citizens were scared to voice their opinions as the frumentari began to arbitrarily search homes and shake down the local population for bribes. Their reputation deteriorated. Soon, any public association with the order could hurt one's social standing or produce severe repercussions. In 217, Emperor Macrinus appointed Marcus Oclantinius Aventus, the former head of the Frumentari and the prefect of the Praetorian Guard, to the Senate. This decision was widely derided by the Roman establishment and resulted in the downfall of Macrinus. The Frumentari became so hated in the forthcoming decades that the emperor Diocletian who ruled from 284 to 305, decided to disband the force for fear that he could suffer public backlash by associating with them. This act was done purely for public spectacle, as he simply replaced them with a new secret service called the Agentes en Rebus, or General Agents. They are from civilian backgrounds and far more numerous than the Frumentari, numbering 1,200. But abuses of power continued in this new group. 
It continued to function as late as 700 in the Byzantine capital of Constantinople. So even though the group wasn't liked, it was still useful. While the Frumentari were among the first fully developed 